Hello, everybody, and welcome back to yet another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. My name is Charles, and with me today, as always, is my lifelong friend and co-host, Dylan. I'm ready to talk some fantasy with my friend, Charles. (laughs) I'm ready to talk some fantasy with my friend as well, Dylan, and not just any fantasy today. You know, as we've mentioned, we, we've we been doing a lot of extracurricular reading lately, and we have have a lot of interesting books to discuss. We've kind of gone off the reading schedule. We both went rogue a little bit. I oh. had read, um, what was it that I read? The Once and Future King, which was fantastic, yes. and that was the last episode. And you've done some reading as well, Dylan, right? Yeah, I read the first book in The Great Coats. I was gonna say trilogy just like automatically but I believe <laughs> it might even be like yeah I'm gonna say it's a trilogy even though there's like is it I think there's there might even be five books or there's no I think four I believe it's a quartet oh. but uh, yeah that's uh that's not a trilogy the only other quartet that comes to mind is that Chatherine Voyage quartet, uh, Charles. So you know when you're dealing with quartets that we're going to have a good time. And I'll say, we should double check, by the way, that this is a quartet. Well, it's confusing because I'm looking it up on Goodreads. It's like book point five, book point six, and then book... You don't count those. Book five says Tales of the Great Coats, volume one, swashbuckling fantasy stories. So Ooh. it sounds like the original is a quartet, but it does continue yeah. to. I think that's just Goodreads not grouping, not knowing how to group short stories that are separate yeah. from like a contained story arc in the same yeah. world. But who knows what Sebastian's uh, intent is for the Great Coat series. But there are lots of more beyond the four main novels here to get into. Yeah, I- I'm going to say, A, now I understand why I was confused, and B, let's call it a quartet. I don't, yeah. I don't think it's a quintet, if that last one's like a short story anthology. Yeah. Is quintet even the right right word? Anyway, I want to say, It doesn't Charles, matter because we're, go, we're sticking with the quartet. Yeah, we're bearing the lead here because The mm. Traitor's Blade, the first book in uh, this awesome great coats trilogy that's what mm. i read and i'm gonna say charles you said trilogy this yeah. is oh <laughs> quartet quartet uh, <laughs> i i find it so hard not to say trilogy at the end of a series i'm just gonna start saying series all the time that's the great a good, coats yeah. series yeah that's a professional go. move right there oh yeah so the traitor's blade uh, or just traitor's blade Uh, Mm. by Sebastian de Castell. This is probably one of my favorite favorite books of the last year or so for me. Like, has a case for my favorite book, just for my own personal taste of the last 12 months in terms of, it was one of those books that uh, you find yourself kind of drifting off, thinking about like, oh, can't wait till I have some time to sit down with that again. Like, I find that not every book does make me feel that way. Like, even mm-hmm. in some books, I'm enjoying them, but I don't always have that sense of like, oh, I just can't wait to get back into that world and start reading that again. And this book, for a variety of reasons, evoked that feeling for me. And whenever it does that, I'm like, that's so huge. That I cannot believe you read this without me now hearing that. I feel so left out. <laughs> because yeah. Sebastian de Castell is one of those authors that keeps coming up in fantasy book recommendations. And we've spoken to Nicholas Eames, Christian Cameron, and they all cite Sebastian as a great friend and, and peer and influence as well. And we you know we've had some back and forth on the socials, and it's one of those things where it's like he's been on my TBR for forever and I've just never found the place to to start with him or the opportunity to start. And then here you go, making it even harder for me now that you've started this journey without me. So I am feeling a little left out, but it is good to hear that it it kind of re-sparked some e- excitement. And after binging so much fantasy this year, 
by hitting your hitting your taste. That's really interesting. It makes me want to pick it up right now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is one that our, our tastes overlap a lot, Charles. Mm-hmm. I think this would have a lot that you would really enjoy. So we'll talk more about the details in a spoiler-free fashion here. Mm-hmm. But let's start with the premise of Great Coats number one, Traitor's Blade, okay. which was a Goodreads Choice Award nominee for Best Fantasy in 2014. Oh. It just got wacky. Like, I, I think of Sebastian de Castell as, like, this fresh new voice in the genre. And, of course, <laughs> he is. But I'm like, oh, wow. He was yes. publishing a decade ago and somehow we didn't read any of his books until i picked this one up now so shame on us charles for not reading anything but i i do get what you're saying about Mm -hmm. this where do i start because de castell is super prolific i believe he has like 16 books or something like that out like just got his Mm -hmm. 16th book out so it when someone's that prolific it almost becomes kind of hard to figure out where to start but and was this his this, first published? Novel? I believe this was his okay. first, yes. And I'll say, Charles, he started off with a bang. And let's read that premise oh. here to ground everyone let's into go. the world. Falcio is the first cantor of the Great Coats. Trained in the fighting arts and the laws of Tristia, the Great Coats are traveling magisters upholding King's Law. They are heroes. Or at least they were, until they stood aside while the dukes took the kingdom and impaled their king's head on a spike. Now, Tristia is on the verge of collapse, and the barbarians are sniffing at the borders. The dukes bring chaos to the land, while the greatcoats are scattered far and wide, reviled as traitors, their legendary coats in tatters. All they have left are the promises they made to King Palus to carry out one final mission. But if they have any hope of fulfilling the king's dream, the divided greatcoats must reunite, or they will also have to stand aside as they watch their world burn. Yeah, wow. That's, yeah, that's pretty exciting stuff right off the bat. And mm-hmm. to talk a little bit around Sebastian de Castell and who he is, he has an interesting little part of his bio that I'll read here. Oh. He's kind of a, a Renaissance man in the, uh, you think of someone like his friend, Christian Cameron, who we've had on the show a few times. And uh, it gives you some of those those feelings here, and, and he even gives a nod to it in the blurb. Uh, Sebastian de Castell had just finished a degree in archaeology when he started work on his first dig. Four hours later, he realized how much he actually hated archaeology and left to pursue <laughs> a very focused career as a musician, ombudsman, interaction designer, fight choreographer, teacher, project manager, actor, and product strategist. His only defense against the charge of unbridled dilettantism is that he genuinely likes doing these things and that, in one way or another, each of these fields plays a role in his writing. He sternly resists the accusation of being a Renaissance man in the hopes that more (laughs) people will label him that way. (laughs) Smart. And Yes, that's what you got. Oh, I wouldn't say I'm a Renaissance man, exactly. <laughs> you can, but I definitely yeah. wouldn't. <laughs> the reverse the, psychology effect. <laughs> and I think that gives you a good sense of how strong de Castell's voice is, right? Mm-hmm. Even his uh, little author blurb that many people take the opportunity to just be like, uh, author, author R. Johnson uh, like lives in Maine with his wife, two kids, and his dog Fluffy. <laughs> he, when he's not writing, he spends his time hiking in the wilderness of Maine with his dog Fluffy. <laughs> and it's like, no, Sebastian de Castell comes in hot with that awesome, witty uh, voice that he has mm-hmm. and that he takes into his uh, first book here in Trader's Blade. Yeah, and it's interesting with the archaeology background. You know, he's like um, Indiana Jones, but he just quit immediately and was like, 
<laughs> gonna go into project management and fantasy writing <laughs> which mad respect um yeah and it sounds like too his with his debut into the into the fantasy world he kind of hits a lot of these i'm gonna say classic beats you know we've been branching out in our fantasy reading and all different kinds of genres but this seems to stick to the core of where we kind of come from in terms of our influence and fantasy you got your adventure you got your swords and um do we have sorcery as well i'm assuming we do but um it it, it seems like a classic adventure intrigue tale yeah i think you hit the nail on the head there charles it is kind of in our sweet spot in the sense of uh, it's got epic fantasy elements to it for sure. It's got rogue-ish characters. I, I wouldn't quite say. I'll get into it a little bit more. I wouldn't quite describe them as rogues in the strict D&D archetype rogue sense, but definitely in their their wittiness and the way they're kind of they have this quippy camaraderie. The three main characters, they're mm-hmm. it gives you some Lies of Locke Lamora vibes in that sense, Charles. Where a mm-hmm. uh, lot of camaraderie between the three main characters, Falcio, Kest, and Brass, and you have a oh, sorry Brasti. And you have a lot of, like, funny exchanges with some one-liner quip-type stuff. Uh, People compare it a lot to the Three Musketeers uh, for, Mm. I guess, the reason of there's three of them. And they they do have (laughs) rapiers. Uh, They Uh, do, yeah, so... their swords. I I'm gonna be honest, Charles. I haven't read the original Three Musketeers. Like we're all mm-hmm. aware of the idea of the Three Musketeers, yeah. but I don't know how many of us have read it. Certainly, certainly not not I, Charles. Uh, Nor I, Dylan. I I have not read it either. I'm familiar with the many adaptations, but it always seems to be like a style over a story where it's just like you you've got like the the big hats, the long capes, the rapiers, you're sliding around, you're doing lots of fast sword fighting with rapiers. Like, it's more of a vibe, I feel like, than yeah. anyone who's actually, like, read the story and compared the notes. But, hey, if it's a compa- if it, people are comparing it, I'll, I'll believe it. I don't know what that means, but I'll, I'll believe it. <laughs> well, people are comparing it, and people are loving it. I'll say okay. that it, yeah, it got... Uh, five stars from a lot of our, our friends, Mark Lawrence, friend of the show, he mm-hmm. wrote a review where he said, I'm giving this five stars since it's a gripping read with genuine emotion and excitement and solid wow. writing. It also wow. got five stars from both Gwyn brothers of the Brothers Gwyn, uh, from MJ Kuhn, who is author of uh, Among Thieves, uh, a mm-hmm. roguish uh, book as well. Uh, it got five stars from Blaze from Under the Radar Books and from Peter Swordsmith. So all those, fo- I believe every single one of those people have been on our show. So all friends and mm. all folks who love this book uh, and uh, gave it five stars. And wow. I, yeah, I gave it five stars as well. I totally agree with them. It's, I, I mentioned that it's a great fit for our personal taste, Charles, and it's not just it's epic fantasy, it's roguish. There's tons of action in the book. It's mm-hmm. like, I you just get this sense, like certain authors kind of have this, uh, just this uh, sense themselves of, okay, you know, like I could see this starting to drag if I don't throw in some action here, but they have this ability to throw that action in without it ever feeling forced because mm-hmm. you don't want to just throw in a random fight scene just for like, oh, I don't want people to get bored. You want it to mean something and have a role in the plot. And mm-hmm. I would say that Sebastian de Castell uh, does a great job of making sure, okay, I'm going to fit in some fight scene here but it's going to fit with the theme or it's going to help develop my characters or it's going to advance the plot and because of that it's just got this fantastic pacing i think that's Mm -hmm. part of what mark was getting at there by calling it a gripping read it is 325 pages on on the kindle version and 
it's it just flies by. It's this wow. very yeah. So uh, it's this very focused story, uh, which we've come to really enjoy more. I think over time <laughs> yeah. is this idea of like okay, it's really one character story here, and we get to pay a lot of attention to that person's character development. And mm-hmm. we also get a lot of that character's really awesome voice here mm-hmm. because it's a first person narrative. And mm-hmm. not only is it a first person, it's very directly communicating with the reader, where mm-hmm. uh, it's a kind of thing I would compare this aspect of it, even though it's not a frame story, I, I would compare it to like name of the wind where yes in that book quoth is telling the story to other characters who are also in the larger frame story okay. but in terms of the voice being that of a storyteller who is saying hey yeah you might think a smart person would do this for example well yeah they probably would <laughs> but instead i ended up doing this you know yeah. some that kind of bit where not every first person narrative has that kind of breaking the fourth wall aspect to it of being told a story. But, and it's, I think a risky maneuver because it could be cringy. I think if the voice isn't good, but Mm. as you can tell from Dick Castell's little author description that he wrote there, he's got such a great voice and ability to speak to the reader that it is really a pleasure being in Falcio's voice, which is just as witty as you'd imagine from uh, what I just read earlier. From the author description, absolutely. And, you know, I feel like sometimes when anyone, like, looking for a new book to read and is considering fantasy, right, I feel like they just want to know that they're going to get something, like, entertaining, gripping, fun and so just to like hear those recommendations of like yeah this book delivered on all fronts and you hear it from other respected authors and and friends in the genre too i I just feel like sometimes picking up a fantasy book can be such a risk there's hundreds of them out there and it's like is this one even going to deliver on the baseline of like just scratching that itch that i'm looking for in like a fantasy like adventure sword fighting world and so it's good to hear that so many people and yourself included kind of champion this book as delivering on that experience and you know obviously it's a good reach choice award nominee and it, i see that it won a bunch of other awards like nominations and awards and things as well um <clears throat> Like um, David Gemmel Award for Fantasy, a standing, Astounding Award for Best New Writer, like a couple other, you know, um, nominations. So, like, it, it's just like to know that that's, hey, if you were looking for a fun fantasy adventure, cleverly written, like entertaining, fast paced, like it keeps you hooked and flipping the pages, like that is a huge endorsement for sure. Yeah, definitely. It has a very modern feeling to it as well, which Mm -hmm. I think would make it accessible if you're just kind of recommending a book to someone. You're like, okay, I really want to make sure that this delivers for this person. And yeah, it's not like, you know, we love, let's say, The Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson. But even as accessible as Sanderson is, and obviously that series in particular for whatever reason has found a way to be amazingly accessible despite yeah. being like thousand plus page books mm-hmm. uh, for each installment. But even that, even knowing all that, I personally like will almost never recommend that book to someone who's just starting out with fantasy. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I know it's worked for lots of people, but sure. I just don't have it in me to be like, <laughs> Hey, like you might not know if you love. Try fantasy, dipping your toes with this, a thousand like thousands page of page, unfinished, yeah. like actively ongoing, massive magnum opus. <laughs> yeah, it's like how about it this three hundred twenty-five page book that focuses on one interesting character and uh, follows 
that character and his group, it's Falcio, Keston, Brosty are the three musketeers uh, mm-hmm. of this book. The great coats in this way. And they pretty much keep the pace moving with both action, both their witty dialogue. And it's also got some of that dark side to it as well without like going so far into the grim dark that I worry about its accessibility. Like there is some pretty gruesome stuff. There is mm-hmm. like torture and off screen rape and some grisly death. So it's like stuff that you want to make sure people are at least okay with. And if you, mm-hmm. you know, if you're not, that's your, uh, your content warning not to get into this, mm-hmm. but it doesn't have that it's like if you can handle game of thrones you can more than handle this Mm -hmm. i would say in terms of the darkness and i wouldn't say it has like thematically it doesn't come off as extremely grim dark but it can uh, definitely scratch some of that darker side of fantasy itch for fans of uh, that grim dark subgenre that's yeah i mean for me that's right along my alley like i'm okay with some of the more explicit content but that's a good thing to kind of point out it's like okay i don't think the three musketeers had this kind of stuff going on when it was written in like the late 1800s or whenever the heck that book came out but yeah it does like the content warning is important and it seems like it's somewhere between sanderson and game of thrones (laughs) somewhere in the middle there in terms of his explicit content which is a good place to be, I feel like, especially for a modern, like, post-Grimdark World adventure story. It's like, yeah, that kind of content kind of comes with the genre sometimes, so. Right, and it's got so much humor and such uh, witty dialogue uh, and such a great humorous voice from that first-person narrative that it never does feel too dark like even during those moments where uh, a different a different writing style would make it feel grim dark you have falcio kind of making light of a lot of the things but not in a way that would be i would say poor taste like Mm -hmm. there's definitely an awareness from sebastian de castell of where like okay now this this part needs to be a little bit more serious but it never gets you to that point where you're just like dude I don't know if I can keep reading this. (laughs) It always kind of keeps you up. And yeah, and part of it is, you know, this book is often described as swashbuckling. Like you'll Mm -hmm. see that all the time. And even, uh, yeah, swashbuckling. So that, like, I think that's good in the sense of getting across the vibe. Like that's part of what drew me to it was hearing the word swashbuckling and it just Mm -hmm. evokes a sense of oh like rogues even though like i said the character's a little bit different from your typical rogues like falcio as the first canter of the great coats i go to like pirates of the caribbean you know where it's like they're rogue but they're like more just comedic and adventure and like yes scoundrel like (laughs) scoundrel like (laughs) yeah but even then i would say it's like the book feels that way while like falcio actually has this very mm, intense moral code like they used to be traveling magisters that Mm. went around upholding the laws of the king which is not exact and and while they've fallen on hard times after their king got killed and they kind of were scattered to the winds Falcio definitely maintains that sense of moral fiber. Like he's a more lawful character than you might expect from something where they're calling it swashbuckling or they might call it roguish. It's like you're not imagining this character who's like, uh, oh, yeah, the king's laws are very important to me. I would say, though, oh, the character Brosty is more typical roguish in his attitudes, but he's like, an archer which is also a little bit off the beaten path of a rogue and then uh, you've got cast who's not as like humorous as the other ones and is like a great sword fighter that's what he's really known for and it's 
all that stuff, it's like swashbuckling somehow fits really well to the vibe of these characters <laughs> and what they do. But at the same time, I'm like, doesn't swashbuckling mean like water or pirates right. or something i'm like i was like what is the swash in swashbuckling i was like isn't mm-hmm. that isn't the water swashing in some way like uh, i i really didn't know what swashbuckling meant once i got going with this because it's not water based like they're not which is what i assumed ship. again I, I think yeah pirates of the caribbean and all that is swashbuckling or like treasure island you know like that that's yeah. swashbuckling yeah, I mean, so I, I am curious from a like definition standpoint if swashbuckling requires un- good. So swashbuckling, well, according to I guess what whatever comes up Oxford Dictionary mm-hmm. when you Google mm-hmm. stuff, engaging in daring and romantic adventures with bravado or flamboyance, which I think is fair to mm-hmm. this book. But then, of course, the example is like a crew of swashbuckling buccaneers. It's like, <laughs> and literally the other, it's like you could use as a noun for daring and romantic adventure. And the example is uh, the film is heavy on the swashbuckling and high seas adventure. So it's like everyone kind of knows, like, there's a little bit of sense that it should have something to do with pirates. Water? <laughs> <laughs> pirates. Like, but I guess. By definition, that is not required. But it's funny. I looked up swash and swash means swash <laughs> or for, for wash in geography is a turbulent layer of water that washes up on the beach after an incoming wave is broken. It's like some origin of this word does indicate like yeah water is involved waves are involved right and who like but I, buckle like is like just the yeah. sword on the on your hip kind of thing like i don't know but they do have swords on their hips we'll, we'll give i, I think that, that's girls. and they've got like flowy flamboyant kind of outfits it sounds yeah. like so I, I feel like that's and then there's emphasis on adventure and i yes. feel like that's to me i don't know we're there's no ships there's no pirates there's no water is what you're saying there's none of those things uh i would say there's no pirates and i mean water does not play a large role like i'm trying to remember if there's any part that i would say was was nautical in nature but i would say i don't i don't think so I can't remember a single part of it that really heavily involved. There's no pirate's code. There's no parlay. There's no sunken well, treasure. There's nothing. There's no <laughs> sunken treasure. There's there's not pirate's code, but they are supposed to be upholding the king's code. laws. Mm. And that's considered... There are knights, and knights have honor, but it's kind of yeah. one of those uh, things where... Falcio's like, yeah, well, what, like, what even is honor? Like, they just <laughs> honor is just listening to the person who's in charge of them when the, those people tell them to do horrible stuff. So, <laughs> Falcio is more of the attitude of. So, like, S- Sebastian his, is exploring the boundaries of swashbuckling adventures yes. <laughs> in his latest book. He's adventuring his first beyond, book. yeah, <laughs> adventuring <laughs> beyond the typical swashbuckling. I mean, I would say. It feels like that as long as you can get past this idea. It's a vibe. Maybe isn't in people's heads to the same extent as us of mm-hmm. like swashbuckling means pirates. But it has that feel. And like you said, are there Charles, like pistols and stuff in this? Is there guns? Um, Not that that needs to be in swashbuckling, yeah. but I feel like sometimes there is. I'm trying it's like a so giant main... pistol <laughs> that, that shoots one bullet, you know? It's like a mini hand cannon. And they just pull out that boom. I'm trying to remember because it's been a little bit now. I think there may have been a moment or two that involved like a old-fashioned gun. But, the pri- but definitely the – and don't quote me on that. But yeah. definitely the primary – way that people would try to attack other people right. from long distance would be through archery like brosty is an archer and it's not okay. like there's this thing where it's like how could you be an archer that is so out of date but right. i'm trying to remember if it's just 
they definitely there were crossbows. I'm trying to remember if there's ever any moment with an actual gun. If there was, it was not a lot. And it would have been like an old timey thing where they like take a while to reload. But I feel like I, I'm remembering a scene where it's like Falco was like, I'll be damned if I give this person time to reload. But I feel oh. like it might have been a crossbow. And I'm trying to yeah, remember, or but, yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah. So you this is obviously um a quartet. So you've obviously. read book one. Obviously, so obvious. It's obvious to anyone, especially those <laughs> looking at a thing that says Great Ghost number five. <laughs> yeah. Five point one. Uh, yeah. uh, but um, so, I mean, you how? What's the ending like? How are we set up for book two? Have you started book two yet? Like, where are we at here in the series? I would say that this book delivers on a complete story. Okay. It has that. It's become so cliche for us to say this at this point, but it <laughs> does have that standalone with sequel potential feel Smart. to it, but a little bit more leaning toward the. It would give that sense of like, uh, if there wasn't a sequel, like, there is still stuff for these mm-hmm. that these characters need to do from here. Like, there's that sense. So I think it delivers on a complete story while leaving some threads open that are big enough threads where it kind of feels like a standalone wouldn't have wouldn't have been enough. But I guess I'm also biased when I really, really, really enjoy a book where mm-hmm. you're like, uh, maybe in a book that's more like a four star read, some of those threads don't seem like as big a deal to yeah, get yeah. <laughs> wrapped up. You're like, okay, I well, see. there's still that thing, but I don't care that much. <laughs> like, uh, like you want I, more, you want more, you know, and you're you're and, paying more attention to what potentially could be out there for yeah an extended series. But you haven't read it yet, right? No, I have not. But this is one that we've gotten into this pattern here, Charles, which is for our wonderful listeners mostly. And at this point, I've learned to enjoy it where Mm -hmm. we're like, okay, we want to cover the breadth of the fantasy genre and Mm -hmm. provide a lot of content for a lot of different people. And Mm -hmm. just going deeper and deeper into series for our show isn't as accessible to people because then it's like, okay, like now we're doing great coats 5.2. And it's like, well, I'm sure I'll, I'll love great coats 5.2. If that exists, Uh, it's like, okay, now you're requiring a lot of Mm -hmm. books for someone to, to be able to listen to this episode. So we kind of do a lot of jumping around of like, it would be something like great coats one. Okay. Now we're reading book one of, whatever you know whatever other prominent series we might jump into and right i'll say and sebastian I've at this point pretty, prolific author he's got other series too yes i've gotten pretty good this goes against my initial reading nature which was read through series read mm-hmm. through next series now i'm like typically able to read through one even if it does leave some stuff open for a sequel i'm like okay well i'm sure i'll get back to this at some point let's read Mm -hmm. the first book of another series and i can even do that when like i i talked about semlin ascends and i was like no i would not call that one standalone sequel potential i would say that really relies on a sequel Um, Mm -hmm. i would say this book was so good for me and so enjoyable that i was like i just want to dive into the next book right now (laughs) we have other books on our reading schedule that kind of we have to prepare for like interviews and stuff like that so i can't quite dive in yet but i really wanted to which says a lot because i've gotten so comfortable with Mm -hmm. okay like i can put this on pause for interesting you you, but this one i mean i'm bookmarking it for sure i'm gonna it, it is on the TBR officially, so maybe I'll get to it yeah. soon. Who knows? But, um, I mean, how could I not at this point with, with that kind of a recommendation? So hopefully we can, you know, work in more Sebastian in the in the near future. That would be awesome. And 
I'm excited, man. It sounds like a sounds like a great great recommendation. Yeah, I mean, I feel very strongly about it. I do. Can I quibble, Charles? Though, can I can I quibble? Give some quibbles in a, of a five Quibble star, away. yeah, five star read. But I do want to say a couple things, and then okay. I'll get back to saying some positive things. We'll we'll end on that strong yeah. note. But this one thing that bothered me, mm-hmm. and I don't know, I was surprised by this. Uh, there's, I think, multiple points, but one in particular where. The character, you know, you're in this first person uh, narrative from Falcio, and he'll talk about something that's pretty important or pivotal, and he'll be it'll be something like, "Oh, there's this guy who's a really amazing fighter. Like basically, no one can beat him." And then I beat that guy in a fight, even though I know he's way better than me. Uh, Mm -hmm. And that's because I knew this one thing, this one secret thing, and Mm -hmm. that's how I was able to pull it off. But I'll never tell anyone how I did that, and Mm -hmm. (laughs) like no matter what. And then I think in most books where that when there's moments like that, you're like, okay, but we're going to find out by the end of this book because this Uh has piqued my interest. Mm -hmm. And it'll like – be referenced uh, multiple times throughout the book and then it's like he actually just straight up never reveals to you (laughs) how that happened he was serious And there's like multiple (laughs) yeah it's like no i literally am telling you i'm never going to tell you (laughs) and then he does it and i was like but i really want to know and i feel like that's a little bit of a i mean i don't want to call it a promise to the reader that was unfulfilled because I guess you're literally telling the reader, no, I'm not going to tell you. So, but I guess I've read enough books where those kind of mysteries are hinted at, and then you usually do find out by the end and it's satisfying. So that kind of mm. bothered me. Well, there's three bit. other books. Maybe you'll find I out. I know. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe it's in, or maybe he's taken the, that to the grave. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's in one of the additional books. Maybe it's in one of the ones with a decimal. Who knows? <laughs> but I'm going to find this out. <laughs> Even if yeah. we need to get Sebastian on the show and I need yeah. to get him to admit it off the air, what happened. Uh, but though I do wonder, like, if an author doesn't reveal that, are they like, no, I actually don't know. So I'm just going to pretend it was something. Yeah, like interested. the J.J. Abrams effect, where it's just like, create a bunch of yeah. really interesting mysteries, but we don't know what they're going to resolve to, but that doesn't matter. The important thing is that they're mysterious and, int- and intrigue, you know, interesting. Yeah. So <laughs> I feel that. I feel that. So, yeah. all right. I guess we have to wrap it up now. When you mentioned there, you know, we want to wrap it up. Was that all your gribbles, by the way? Did were there more gribbles? Did you say gribbles? Isn't that what you said? I think it's quibbles. Oh, quibbles! <laughs> gribbles, that a quibbles. Word? I have no idea. <laughs> you said it. Is, uh, <laughs> That's what I thought I, you said. <laughs> to are you say you disapp- to say you or say you disapprove of something that is not important? Yeah. That's what I would say. I'm disapproving of something that's not important right now, Charles. Got it, got it. I, the, uh, one other thing, there's, I mean, this is a decade ago, but there is like a woman in refrigerators trope part to this, mm. which I do think bears mention. I mean, I didn't find it absolutely egregious, but, and it, yeah, like I said, it was a decade ago and people weren't thinking as much about uh, that and how that can be harmful, but uh, wanted to make sure I mentioned that. But I'll say this book overall, uh, it is uh, super unique in its storytelling, even though it does kind of evoke some elements of, let's say, The Three Musketeers or The Lies of Locke Lamora, some of those mm-hmm. kind of uh, feelings. At least the group gives you gentleman bastard type feelings. The plot very focused great voice awesome dialogue Mm -hmm. Uh, not (laughs) not some wacky complex hard to follow plot or anything like that it's a uh, i will say uh, it's kind of interesting because one of the characters main like that main mission that's hinted at in the uh, (laughs) 
in the premise is like their king before he was killed was like, look for my, I have no idea how to pronounce this word. It's C-H-A-R-O-I-T-E. Cheroit? Cheroit? Uh, he's like, look for my Cheroit. And it's like dead. And uh, that's part of the premise of the book. And they just have no guidance as to mm-hmm. <laughs> like what that is how to go about looking for it, anything like that. So there are times where it can start to feel a little directionless, but I would say once we get toward like the, uh, like a third of the way in, you're like, okay, I really do have a sense of where this book is going. Um, I do want to speak a little to the, it's pretty light on the magic I'll say, but it is present. And then I'll say, it does get a little bit of criticism for world building sometimes, which actually to me was a feature, not a bug. Like I felt like the world building was enough. It was there and it served Mm -hmm. the characters. It served the plot. It did what it had to do. But if Mm -hmm. you're someone who's like a deep dive world builder person, like this is going to have a ton for you to chew on there. But Mm -hmm. all that came together for me for just this awesome swashbuckling Ooh. adventure charles that's uh, us with just exactly what i needed at this time and i feel very confident recommending this book to a lot of folks and for anyone that the elements we've been talking about here uh feels like a good fit for them i mean you you have me sold i got it bookmarked i'm i'm, I'm ordering it for sure and i also want to make clear a gribble is a word <laughs> Okay. It's a noun. It's a small marine isopod that bores into submerged wooden structures, often causing damage to pier timbers. So you could <laughs> use that as like an adjective, as just a little detail that kind of burrowed in there and is chipping away, you know? And causing damage? De- causing damage. <laughs> causing damage to, to your pier timbers. opinion. <laughs> that are my that the pure timbers in the that were my enjoyment adventure. of the book. Yeah, yeah. exactly. In the pure, yeah, Joel, shiver me timbers. <laughs> in the pure timbers, that was my experience of reading this book. I would say that the small the, marine isopod yeah, was this weird word you're describing. This gribble. What? But no, the the word. Look for my cherry. Uh, whatever it was. Cherry yeah, ad. that was. <laughs> That that was a small marine isopod that was causing damage to the to the pier timbers of my enjoyment of the book. See, so uh, it wasn't that crazy. No, I'm, just kidding. <laughs> I'm just lucky that something came up on Google. <laughs> and hey, we made it work. Is and it was marine related. It was it marine related. It was a swashbuckling word. For That's sure. a swashbuckling word for sure. Is a gribble, and uh, there a we go. We all learned white, something today. <clears throat> I learned that I have to read this book. Yes, and I learned what a gribble is and a quibble. So I'm just. <laughs> This has been a big day. I think that's more than enough for one episode, if I'm being honest. <laughs> yeah, I, once we're I brought about... in my um, uh, understanding of the word swashbuckling as well. Like, I just become more open minded just as a human being overall. I will say, I'm, as I'm looking up. Oh, okay. Never mind. I was going to say, I don't know if quibble can be a noun. So maybe I misused it, which is what, of course, would have caused the confusion that made mm. you think I was referring to a quibble. Of course, of course. <laughs> but uh, it, I believe, yeah, you can use it as a noun. A yeah, you totally can. About something that is not very important. No, you, you use the word use flawlessly. I just. <laughs> you have no quibbles with my <laughs> use of the word quibble, besides the no fact quibbles. that I should have used the word gribble. <laughs> no quibbles no gribbles I, just, I you know i was like i was close enough to the word that it was fine <laughs> one of those uh just you know just what do they call it when you're able to just like kind of get the context of a word like you're able you read enough that you can kind of understand a vocab word without knowing its definition your comp your reading comprehension whatever they call that i I think they call that uh, a gribble. <laughs> this episode's starting to become a gribble to my to my patients here. The peer of my uh, 
<laughs> the fear of my attention span. <laughs> uh, well, Charles, I'll say this is one of the most educational episodes for us. We learned a lot of words. We learned we swash. We learned swashbuckling, or at least we clarified whether it needed mm-hmm. water or not. Uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We learned quibble. Well, one of us learned quibble. Yes. Uh, the the other one of us learned gribble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I totally knew that word. You know, that's what I thought you said. I thought you're being very clever. Um, <laughs> you know how it is. But uh, yeah, we're we're better men at the end of this. What can we say? And it's all because of the wonderful work from Sebastian de Castell making all of this possible. So um, yes. Without Trader's Blade, I would have had much less enjoyment uh, over the last couple weeks of reading, and Mm -hmm. uh, we also never would have learned some of these wonderful words and been able to share them with you, our listeners, and... Uh, and a dearly beloved listener, I think it is time for us to to probably move forward based on the, the way this episode Absolutely. has veered. This is one off of our course. trademark devolved endings to an episode. <laughs> yeah. It's just like everything just kind of gets thrown out the window, but somehow we we get there, and there's some value to be had at the end. So thank you for listening, and, and let's just get the outro music going at this point, right? I, I think so. I would say this episode became rudderless by the end. Oh, well said. You well like said. That? That nautical. I do like that. The the rudder is the part of the boat that steers the ship. Yeah. So. But steer us into that sweet, sweet outro music, Charles. I shall. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, one and all, for listening to yet another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. If you like what you heard today and you want to support the show, one of the best ways to do that is by following us and engaging with us over on the socials. That's at the FDF Podcast on Instagram and TikTok, and then at the FDF Podcast with the number one at the end for Twitter. Now, Dylan, if they like what they heard today and they want to support us even more than following us and engaging with us over on social media what can they do toss five stars to our podcast which you can do over on spotify you just gotta go to the friends talking fantasy podcast page and click about then click where the stars are and you know what to do from there give us five of them you can also rate and review on apple podcast that means you can write nice things about us you can say hey i actually have no quibbles or gribbles with this episode that i listened to because it was perfect and deserving of five stars uh, just like mark lawrence rated it. sebastian day castell's book five stars <laughs> yes uh, but just listening is more than enough thank you so much for doing that well said, Dylan. Just listening, you guys are amazing. Thank you for making it all the way to the end. Thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And as always, guys, go forth and conquer, friends. 